On today's program, former host Steve Owens has some succulent plant basics, including care and propagation. David Hillock visits with Casey Sharber at the Myriad Botanical Gardens about southwest injury in trees. Floriculture professor Bruce Dunn has scarification and scarification techniques for better seed germination. We have gardening tips for April, and Barbara Brown prepares a winter vegetable soup. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. A group of plants that have really become popular are succulents, like what we have right here. Now there are a couple of reasons why people are really starting to like these plants. They're easy to take care of, and there are a lot of really unique, unusual, just really cool varieties that are very attractive. So very attractive plants, easy to take care of. You can see why people are really starting to like these plants. Now succulents are easy to take care of because they don't require a lot of water. Most succulents are native to very dry areas like deserts or other low rainfall areas. So they have to survive extended periods with no rainfall. And they do this by storing water in their very fleshy leaves and stems. That's usually how you can tell a succulent because of the swollen or thick fleshy leaves and stems. Right here I've got the leaf of an aloe vera plant, a very common house plant that is a succulent. And you can see that uh, that water starting to ooze out there. Of course the aloe vera juice has lots of those phytochemicals that help ease the pain of scrapes, cuts, and sunburn, but uh, the leaves do hold an incredible amount of water. Now, if you think about cactus plants, you might think, well, are cactus succulents? They are. They also store a lot of water in their trunks or their leaves, and a plant like a cactus is considered a succulent, but us horticulturists have a saying to distinguish the difference between cacti and succulents. It, we explain that all cacti are succulents, but not all succulents are cacti. To be a cactus, you have to actually belong to the cactaceae or the cactus family, whereas succulents come from several different plant families. So once again, all cacti are succulents, but not all succulents are cacti. But there are some succulents that, uh, that do try to mimic cacti, like this pincushion euphorbia we have down here. You can see it looks very similar to the cactus. Succulents are great plants for containers. Outside in the summertime, our containers dry out so much quicker than plants in the ground. So if you put a succulent in one of your containers, you don't have to worry about the watering quite as much. Now, when it comes to the soil mix for containers, I don't use anything different in my uh, succulent soil mix. I use the same mix that I use for all my other plants. I just, I just don't water it that much. And outside, what I usually do with my succulents in their containers is water them about every other week. What you don't want to do is water them too much. One of the easiest ways to kill a succulent plant is to overwater it and get some root rot started. Metal containers are great for growing succulents. They can handle the heat much better than your, your typical plant. Sometimes I'll see people with an old rusty wheelbarrow and they'll plant that with begonias or something like that and they just don't get really good results because those plants can't handle the heat coming off that hot metal. But the succulents are great at doing that. You can plant them in old rusty cans or buckets or things like that. Right here we've got 
the tray out of the top of a metal toolbox and that is all planted with little succulent plants as well. But no matter what type of container you use, make sure you have drain holes in the bottom. If you want to propagate some of your succulents, it's really easy to do. All you really need is a, uh, a pot full of sand that is kept just, just barely moist. And you can usually root a piece of a stem or even a piece of a leaf in uh, uh, certain plants. It's a good idea when you take the stem of one of your succulents to let it sit for about five or six days and let some callus develop on the uh, the wound where it is cut away. It's sort of like a scab or something like that. Those cells kind of harden up and can, can kind of keep the plants from rotting in certain situations. But I'm just going to remove some of these lower leaves here and don't really need any rooting powder or hormone or anything like that. We're just going to insert that into this, this pot of sand that's kept uh, barely moist. Here's a good example of how easy it is to root succulents. This is the leaf of a calancho plant. And this broke off the mother plant a couple of months ago. And we just set it in the bottom of the pot. And it sat there and it got a little bit of moisture. And you can see all the roots started and sort of a little cluster of rooted cuttings coming off this calancho. We can take those and uh, we can separate those and put those in our pot of sand and create a lot more plants. The fruit and nut tips for April are don't spray insecticides during fruit tree bloom or pollination may, may be affected. Disease sprays can continue according to schedule and label directions. Control cedar apple rust at this time as well. When the orange jelly galls are visible on the juniper or the cedars following a rain, begin treating apple and crap apple trees with a fungicide. A fire blight bacterial disease can also be controlled at this time. Plant disease resistant varieties to avoid diseases. The tree and shrub tips for April. Proper watering of newly planted trees and shrubs often means the difference between success and replacement. Remove any winter damaged branches or plants that have not begun to grow. Prune spring flowering plants as soon as they are finished blooming if they need it. Today we're here at the Marriott Botanic Gardens in Oklahoma City. I'm with Casey Sharber, the horticultural director for the facilities here. And Casey, we've noticed today that you are doing a little bit of relandscaping here. Uh, on, on the grounds. Uh, we have some trees that have had some, some damage and you're going to the process of replacing those. Tell us a little bit about what's going on. Yes, um, unfortunately we have some Norway maples that suffered sun scald prior to uh, the current management that's here. Um, but you can see mm. as we go along here all the damage on these trees and what happens is that this time of year in the winter time when the sun is at its hottest, it's in the southwest corner of the horizon. And so about three or four o'clock, that's when the sun's at its hottest and it heats up that southwest side of the tree. Um, when those uh, cells heat up during the daytime and then about an hour later, the sun will set and the temperature immediately drops in the winter time. And so that explodes those cells. So a lot of times you'll see the damage maybe a year or two later, um, but unfortunately we have about 48 trees that have really suffered from that. Yeah, and that's, you know, they, we see this injury most of the time on young trees, especially those that have smooth bark. Right. Maples are very notorious for having this problem. And, yep. uh, and it, particularly this species, which really is not probably the best selection for Oklahoma. It isn't. Um, and so what we're gonna go back in with is green vase Zalkovas. Um, we were looking for a tree that had a very uh, upright canopy that wouldn't shade out our turf too much. And so we think the green vase is a great urban tree. It's often underutilized and it's a new uh, species that we don't have here on the garden. So we're excited to be introducing a new plant to the garden collection. Very good. That's, that's exciting. I, I love the Zelkovas. They're great trees. Yes. But just, you know, wanted to point out what real quickly again with this disease, this is really severe damage on this tree. Usually you don't see it quite so bad. Yeah, and here it goes all the way up into the canopy. And unfortunately, this tree, even though it's not going to die tomorrow or anything, it's just going <laughs> to reduce its overall aesthetics and its life. So 
it's better to take it out while it's younger um, and go ahead and get a new tree in here growing and right. doing what it should be doing. Yeah. And you can see on the bark here, it's, there's callus tissue that's trying to close over it, but it's such a big wound that it's just never going to probably close up completely. Right. And then you've got rot that starts setting in on the inside of the tree. And even though you say, like you say, it might last for years down the road, it now becomes very weak too. Right. So, you know, if you have an event out here and, and wind blows and it falls down, then it, then it becomes a liability. So that's, it's, you're smart for replacing these and not trying to baby them and keep them alive and replacing them with a better better species. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, we're excited. We'll, uh, we'll plan on coming back when you get a chance to start putting in the Zelkovas and uh, look at those and see the process there. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. The lawn tips for April are warm season grass lawns can be established beginning late April from sprigs, plugs, or sod. When using quick release forms of fertilizer, use one pound of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet per application. Be sure to water in all fertilizers after you have applied them. Mowing of warm season lawns can begin now. Cutting height for Bermuda and Zoysia should be one to one and a half inches high and buffalo grass one and a half to three inches high. Grub damage can be visible in lawns at this time. Check for the presence of grubs before applying any insecticide treatments. So a lot of homeowners are interested in growing their own plants from seed. Uh, a lot of seed, you can just plant those out and that's going to germinate and give you the plants back. For, but for some seeds, they're going to have uh, dormancy requirements that have to be overcame. Uh, a couple of those are, uh, a couple of common ones would be uh, scarification and then uh, stratification. So scarification, that's when we're brazing that outer seed coat uh, of the seeds. If they have a hard seed, a hard uh, seed coat with those seeds. And basically it's not allowing any of this water uptake of those seeds. And there's a couple different ways that we can actually abrase those seeds. We can do it through a mechanical method and using sandpaper. And depending on the seed itself, something like this Kentucky coffee tree seed that has a pretty thick uh, seed coat. We're gonna have to braise that several times. And what you're looking for here is a change in color. So basically we've uh, abrased that outer seed coat and we can get to that uh, endosperm or that embryo and that allow that water uptake. Okay, so you can use sandpaper. Other things, if you have large seed and it's really thick seed coat, something like this Kentucky coffee tree, you can use a, a bench grinder, also works really well for it. Um, other methods, and you can use chemical methods if you're dealing with a large number of seeds. If you're only doing a couple of seeds, again, you can scarify those with a, with a file or sandpaper. But for a large number of seeds, you may think about chemical treatment, something like sulfuric acid. Now, this is a pretty toxic uh, chemical to work with. It'll eat through your clothes and eat through your skin, definitely. So, uh, something to consider whenever you're working with it. Uh, pay attention. But other ones that I've seen, uh, the phosphoric acid, so something like that you would find in uh, pop, you know, again, it's a weaker acid than sulfuric. Other ones would be citric acid, so something that you'd find in uh, any of the, the, the fruit juices, those could also work. But for those, you're going to actually would have to soak the seeds for a longer period of time. For sulfuric acid here, again, this is a pretty uh, strong acid, and for it, uh, you can usually soak those for about 15 minutes, and that's usually good enough for those seeds. Okay, so if you Pour a little bit of sulfuric acid, you drop the seeds in here, and then uh, whenever you wash those off, you want to neutralize that to get rid of that acid. But it's a pretty short treatment, um, but you can do a large number of seeds with those kind of treatments. As far as seeds itself, how, how can you tell? Well, you may notice that the seed itself has, uh, it's pretty hard, pretty thick outer seed coat. Some of the smaller seed, you know, you can probably pinch between your fingers like a tomato seed, but some of these here, we've got some examples. This is Kentucky coffee tree seed. I've got uh, soapberry seed, uh, golden rain tree. Uh, this is uh, red bud seed and then hibiscus seed as well. So these are all seeds that have this hard, thick outer seed coat that we can abrase and use that scarification treatment to actually encourage this uh, germination. Okay, and this is just kind of mimicking what's happening uh, in the environment itself, whether these seeds, someone runs over them with their vehicle or they get broken down with the weather over time. Uh, so I mentioned scarification. Another one that, that seeds uh, commonly need that sometimes you'll see on the package itself that it'll say, 
you know, seeds need scarification or you can soak them in water. Okay, so something else that, that you can do as far as the, the chemical side of it, you can just soak them in hot water, usually for about six to eight hours, and that's usually sufficient, uh, or you can soak them overnight. Just make sure that the, that the water is not boiling. You just need it to be warm, but not boiling. Um, another way uh, that we mentioned, okay, so that scarification, another way of overcoming uh, dormancy, some seeds uh, have uh, physiological barriers to that germination. Okay, scarification is a physical barrier, that hard seed coat. If it's a physiological uh, barrier, then you could use stratification. Okay, and so for this one, we could use something like sand or you can use vermiculite. Most people have sand, I think. And I think in this bag here, we put uh, half a cup. And then you would want to add a little bit of water to that. Uh, as far as a little bit, for this uh, half a cup, we add uh, one tablespoon of water here. And the idea is to, get, is to get the media moist, but you don't want it to be soaking wet. Okay, if the seeds sit in, basically are sitting in water, they're uh, eventually going to probably rot out. But the idea behind the uh, physiological dormancy is that it needs some kind of cold treatment to encourage that uh, germination to occur. So for these, we would uh, wet this media here, put it in some kind of bag, and then if we um, had had our seeds, for whatever seeds that we're going to use, we could put those in this bag here. And the keys here is not to completely close that bag because oxygen is important. And then you need cool temperatures. Usually a refrigerator is sufficient for these uh, uh, cool temperatures. And then depending on the seeds itself, it may say that it needs 30 days, it may need 60 days, or it may need 90 days uh, stratification. If it needs the longer side of things, the 60 or 90 days, I would encourage you to look at your seeds about halfway through or uh, about once a month uh, before that due date and start watching them because if they actually, they can actually start germinating and if they do, then you'll see that uh, and you don't pull them out, there'll be this tall spindly growth, it won't have enough light in there and then those plants will never make. Okay, so sometimes you're not really sure. Uh, other ways of determining how long to, to leave the seeds, again, the seed package may tell you, you can also look for references online. We uh, have a fact sheet uh, with uh, Oklahoma State uh, as far as, I think it's E917, and it talks about propagating plants. And in there it lists some examples of seeds that need stratification and then ones that need uh, scarification. Okay, so if you're not really sure, you can give it, uh, as far as the stratification, if you're not really sure, you can give it a little bit on the longer end of things, so maybe leave it in there, you know, 45 days, 60 days, maybe even 90 days, but again, definitely check it to make sure that the seeds uh, haven't already started to germinate. Um, as far as the, the scarification, uh, these are seeds that we did uh, about a week ago, and we can see the, the clear difference here. These were planted out, but the difference here between a, the regular seed, one that hasn't been scarified, and then one that has been scarified, you can actually see where we scarified it right there, and with that uptake of water, you can see that it has swelled, okay? And this one should uh, germinate probably in about another week. Uh, so that's what I have. A couple of tips here, again, just to consider uh, for your for your seeds, that not all seeds that you can just plant, they may have some kind of uh, dormancy requirement. And if the package says scarification, again, that's going to be a braise in that outer seed coat. And if it's stratification, that means some kind of moist, cold uh, treatment. For more information on uh, seed requirements, check out the OSU fact sheet, Propagating Ornamental Plants in Oklahoma. The flower tips for April are most bedding plants, summer flowering bulbs, and annual flower seeds can be planted after danger of frost. This happens around mid-April in much of Oklahoma. Hold off mulching these crops until spring rains subside and soil temperatures warm up. Warm season annuals should not be planted until soil temperatures are in the mid-60s. Let spring flowering bulb foliage remain as long as possible and turn yellow before you cut it back. The vegetable tips for April, wait a little longer for it to warm up before planting cucurbit crops in okra. Plant vegetable crops in successive plantings to ensure a steady supply of product rather than harvesting all at once. Cover cucurbit crops with a floating row cover to keep out insect pests, but be sure to remove them during bloom time.
Today I'm doing winter vegetable soup. Now the ingredients in soup are always flexible, so you can easily change the season on this and turn it into spring or summer. Uh, but since it's winter, I'm going to be using some of the vegetables that are common to winter or that we've stored in freezing and canning. So I have a tablespoon of canola oil, and I'm adding to that a cup of chopped onion and a half a cup of celery. I'm going to turn that down just a little bit more. And we're going to let these simmer and think about each other for about five to six minutes, just until they're uh, beginning to be tender. Towards the very end, I'm going to add a, a clove of garlic that I've chopped up, and then we'll add all the other ingredients to it uh, and let it simmer for about an hour. So once you get a lot of the chopping done, uh, you're good to go. And to be honest, there's not a lot of chopping if you're using canned and frozen foods. So the onion I needed to chop, you might have had that frozen. Celery I chopped, uh, and I've got carrots that I'm going to chop, and you could have used canned or frozen on those also. So everything else is pretty much good to go. Uh, so it's not going to take a lot of, of effort on your part in order to make this ready for a, a cold winter evening or a nice fall or a summer night. I'm going to let this simmer for a few more minutes, and we'll come back. We just let that sweat a little bit. Now I'm going to add the garlic to it. Now the amount of garlic you put in, one clove of garlic would probably be plenty. Uh, I've got a little bit more because they were really tiny. So this is, uh, again, going to be personal preference, as all soups are, which makes them really great to eat because you can make them just with the ingredients that your family likes. I'm also going to add a can, uh, two cups or one pint of tomatoes. Now I've used diced tomatoes. You could use whole tomatoes. If you wanted to, you could use stewed tomatoes, so you have a lot of flexibility there. I've got a cup of thinly sliced carrots. I've got one potato uh, that I cut into cubes. Now the recipe calls for a specific amount, but if yours is a little smaller or a little bigger, it's going to be fine. I've got two cups of frozen peas. Get the rest of them out here. And two cups of frozen corn. Again, here you could use canned if you had those and not the other. And in the spring and summer, you could use fresh. Then I've got uh, two cups of frozen lima beans. Now, one interesting uh, substitution here might be edamame, if you had that instead. Uh, I'm also going to add an eighth of a teaspoon of pepper, a teaspoon of kosher salt, a half a teaspoon of dried basil, a fourth of a teaspoon of dill seed. Now, you don't want a lot of dill, but it adds a surprisingly lot of depth of flavor to this. And a little bit more pepper, and uh, I've got a bay leaf somewhere that didn't make it over here, but this is going to cook for an hour, and we'll put the bay leaf in during that cooking time. Now, bay leaves really do require about that much time for the flavor to actually start coming out. So if you've got something that is going to cook much less than an hour, a bay leaf really isn't going to do you any good. Now for the base of this, I've got some low-fat or fat-free stock or broth. I'm using chicken. You could use vegetable broth. You could even use beef broth on this. And I've got seven cups of it that are going to go in here. And we're going to bring this up to a simmer, and we're just going to let it simmer for one hour. And during that hour, I'm going to sneak over and find that bay leaf, and we'll get that in here too. After about an hour, you can check the vegetables, make sure they're as soft as you want them to be. Now this is a lot of soup. If you come with a small family, uh, this may be more than you need at any one time or any couple of three days. So what you can do with this is take it out and cool it down. I would recommend that you cool it using an ice bath because you want it to cool very quickly. So set the pan in a, a sink full of ice water and stir it fairly often until you get it down to a reasonable temperature of about 40 degrees or so. Uh, then ladle it into containers and you can put it into the freezer. I'd also do that if you're not going to eat it right away, but you're going to serve it later. I would div divide it into smaller batches uh, so that you can chill it down. Um, the ice bath is one of the, the nice ways to do that. You can also fill a, a container with water uh, that you've washed the outside with, freeze it, and then you can actually use that to stir, and that will also cool the soup down very, very quickly as well. This is ready to serve and it looks absolutely terrific. I hope you'll give this one a try. There's nothing else you have to do for it after that hour has gone by other than uh, decide what you want to eat with it, serve it, and enjoy. I hope you'll try this one. It's winter vegetable soup for Oklahoma Gardening. I'm Barbara Brown.
The general landscape tips for April are, hummingbirds arrive in Oklahoma in early April. Get your bird feeders ready using one part sugar to four parts water. Do not use red food coloring. Lace bugs, aphids, spider mites, bagworms, etc. can start popping up in the landscape and garden later this month. Keep a close eye on all plants and use mechanical, cultural, and biological control options first. And finally, be alert for both insect pests and predators. Some pests can be handpicked without using a pesticide. Do not spray if predators, such as lady beetles, are present. Spray only when there are too few predators to be effective. Here's one of the great gardening activities coming up in Oklahoma. Next week, Steve Owens has interesting succulent plants for the landscape. We're back at the Crystal Bridge to find out the history of orchids. Myriad Gardens Director of Horticulture, Casey Sharber, gives us a rare glimpse into the belly of the beast. And David Hillock tries a favorite tropical sweet. Then former host Steve Dobbs also joins us to talk about the exciting horticultural changes on the Oklahoma State University Stillwater campus. And Barbara Brown cooks a caraway cabbage. Join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.